with the days getting increasingly colder and shorter, what do you do to create a cosy atmosphere at home? In Victorian Britain, when the nights drew in, the fireside was the place to be, of course. Seeking out the warmth and the flickering glow of the fire, members of the household would gather here to stave off the winter blues. Conversation, games, jokes, or even an informal supper were the kinds of activities commonly seen at the hearthside. My name's Olivia Gageg, I'm Visual Collections Record Specialist at the National Archives, and in this document display, I'll be showing you some of the design records that we hold in relation to the Victorian hearth. Before modern forms of entertainment, like the wireless or the television were invented, the hearth was the place that brought people together in the home. It was the centre of the drawing room or parlour, which itself was the room of the house that was integral to the concept of the middle class home. A comfortable and well furnished drawing room became symbolic of some of the key notions of Victorian morality. It was a room that served a purpose in bringing the family together for wholesome leisure time, while also making a statement about the family's status and tastes to visitors. The responsibility of curating such a room increasingly fell to the female head of the house, shopping for furnishings and ornaments in order to create a warm and inviting space was a task tied to an ideological view of domesticity. This was helped along with a rise in disposable income among the middle classes. And from the middle of the 19th century, catering to this demand for interior decor and cosiness were a host of manufacturers creating a burgeoning number of wares to fill and furnish the Victorian home. In the design registers of the Board of Trade held at the National Archives, is a collection of over three million designs registered for copyright protection beginning in 1839. Within the 19th century designs, there are a number that relate to the fireplace and its surrounds that can tell us much about how these objects featured in the home. This document display is limited to records that tell us something about the open coal fires found in middle class homes, but you can also find many more designs for heating solutions used in a range of 19th century homes and buildings, including stoves and ranges, and more technical inventions within these records. Many of the designs that we hold for fireplaces were registered by foundries and companies making cast iron wares. Decorative cast iron work played an important part in Victorian design as it was much less expensive to produce than wrought iron. It could be poured into moulds in order to mass produce component parts. Some of the ironworks and foundries that registered designs with the Board of Trade were the Masbra Stove Grate Company based in Rotherham, the Caron Company in Falkirk, and the Colebrookdale Company in the Ironbridge Gorge, the fabled birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. The raised register grate was developed when coal replaced wood as the standard fuel. Standalone register grates could be installed in older fireplace surrounds made of marble or wood, or the entire fireplace, including the mantelpiece, could be made out of cast iron. While decorative, the grates still needed to be technically sound to maximise the efficiency of the fire. Examples of these practical components include an adjustable canopy to redirect heat away from the mantelpiece and back out into the room, sliding draught regulators to keep the fire ventilated, and bivalve grates to reduce smoke. Aside from cast iron, innovations in brass casting made this a popular material for fire grates and fire tools too. Steel also became widely used and would have made a cost-effective choice. Moving on to look at how the fireplace could be decorated beyond metalwork, the designs show that in the later parts of the century, tile surrounds on fireplaces were all the rage. Some of the designs for the cast iron grates show tiles already applied Others, like the Ivanhoe, show parts of the surrounds covered, indicating these designs could be tiled, but the option of which style to choose was left with the consumer. Tile manufacturing was another industry that used moulds to produce large quantities in different designs. This catalogue page shows just a small selection of colourways and patterns a Victorian consumer could have chosen from Minton Hollands & Co, probably the most famous and prolific makers of tiles in the era. This page shows enamelled and myolica designs specifically produced for use in fireplaces and hearths. As well as creating a warm, cosy atmosphere, tiles had a practical purpose in reflecting heat of the fire back into the room. If we look at some of the designs for tools and accessories used to maintain the fire, 
we can see how they too became targets for ornamentation. Coal scuttles, also referred to as coal scoops or coal vases in the records, allowed for a small quantity of the dirty, dusty fuel to be kept next to the fireplace in order to build it up and maintain it throughout the day. This coal vase design was given the name Pendonian, which might have been a misspelling or a play on the word Perdonium, a type of coal scuttle with a slanted cover and an inner removable metal container for the coal, named after its inventor, a Mr Purden. This design for the Brighton coal scoop is deceptively plain. Both this and the Pendonian coal vase were the designs of two separate Wolverhampton-based tin and Japan works, a hub for this type of manufacturing in the 19th century. The lid of the finished article in this design would likely have been decorated with a picture or a design using an enamelling or japanning process. The latter involved a treatment of the surface of the metal to mimic the appearance of Japanese lacquerware. To transfer the coal from the coal vase to the fire, a set of coal tongs or a small shovel was needed. In the 1880s, Castle's Household Guide an encyclopedia of domestic and social economy recommended that the shovel and poker be discarded entirely in favour of tongs in order to save on coal. The reason given was that an overly stoked, fiercely burning fire would smoke, wasting precious fuel. Although functional, this highly decorative pair were undoubtedly made for showing off. Maintaining the fire was a tricky task and bellows were used to inject a strong gust of oxygen to a fire to encourage it back to life when it started to die. This ornamental front for a set of bellows was made from brass. By contrast, the heat and sparks a fire could throw out were something to manage, and a fire guard was again another practical accessory that could have a decorative function too. This design was put forward by William Tonkson Sons, a successful brass foundry from Birmingham, who won gold medals for their work submitted to the Great Exhibitions of 1851 and 1862. Pole screens were popular too, often used to display embroidery work or pictures in a frame. The practical purpose was to act as a shield for the face when seated next to the fire. This early Victorian and rather elaborate design in iron, which I personally rather like, has baby fire-breathing dragons guarding its base. When the fire was not in use, finding ways to disguise the empty cold grates were a challenge for house-proud Victorians. As the 1897 publication The House bemoaned, one of the greatest difficulties that we have to contend with in modern furnishing is the fireplace and how best to disguise it when no fire is in use. Fire screens would have served this purpose somewhat, but there are other creative options on the market. These dried flower fire stove ornaments were one idea put forward by Danish gardener Niels Lund Christensen, who had shops in Saxony and London. He was known for his methods in preserving fresh flowers and his arrangements of grasses and ferns. Fire stove ornaments in the form of coverings were so popular that the lion comique George Leyburn, aka Champagne Charlie, made fun of the practice on the music hall stage in his song Any Ornaments for Your Fire Stoves, mocking the cries of the street sellers, often young girls who touted these wares, as seen depicted on this Christmas card from 1879. But this forlorn character was in fact not the butt of Champagne Charlie's joke. Rather, it was the middle classes who found cause to decorate and adorn every inch of their homes. In colder months, coal fires required daily maintenance, which in the middle class home was assigned to the servant class. To save time, although probably not that of the servant, household manuals advised laying the fire the night before, ready to ignite in the early morning. Cleaning the parlour grate, fire irons and fender was said to take 20 minutes in total. A more serious problem in coal fire maintenance was the issue of soot blocking the chimney flue, a cause of fires in the home. To keep this clear was the job of the chimney sweep, but the inventive Victorians were keen to find methods to make this a cleaner, more efficient and perhaps safer procedure. The complexity of this invention for a parachute machine for sweeping chimneys reminds us of what an involved job the sweep had in the Victorian age. Greenwood's chimney cleaner was another solution put forward for keeping chimney flues clean. This design for its packaging makes the bold and rather heartless claim that it is so effective it will put the sweeps out of business. In advertisements from the end of the century, we see some alternatives to open coal fires making a bid for their position at the heart of the home. In this example for Rippingill's patent oil warming stoves, the mantelpiece of the traditional hearth remains. 
but the grate has been replaced by a gleaming paraffin stove. A young child and her cat sit in closer proximity to the enclosed heat source than they probably would have to an open fire, and in the background, two children warm their hands on a second stove, emphasising the stove's portable, practical and safe qualities. All this advertisement, produced for Arden Hill and Company's era gas fires, even goes so far to suggest that moving up in fortune and in social class is possible based on the time regained by not having to clean and maintain a coal fire. In spite of these bids, coal fires continue to be used widely in homes in Britain, and gas fires would not manage to oust coal significantly for another half century. Thank you for watching this document display, which hopefully gives you a taste for some of the Victorian design records held at the National Archives. If you would like to see some more fireplace related records, or if you would like to find out how you can search for design records yourself using our catalogue, do check out my blog post linked in the description box below. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you have a warm and cosy rest of the day.